All right, guys, one last video for you today. This is the video for pages 271 through 292. I will be posting the video for 292 through 343 over the weekend, which is a nice benefit to those of you who haven't had the quiz yet. I know in Mrs. Likes class, you guys are having your quiz on Friday. But in my class, we're not having it until Monday. So I will have a probably, I may split it up. It's going to be a very long video lecture because you had a lot of reading. Um, but the reading that we're discussing for now really covers most of the trial of Dick and Perry. And so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the evidence and some of the witnesses and how some of that goes down. And, and some of that will be in the later video lecture as well. Um, so we see everybody come in on the first day of the trial. And again, Capote has broken this up nicely for us. We have, you know, the auction at the end of the one night's reading. And now we have the beginning of the trial and everybody comes in, even Floyd Wells, the guy who's in prison, he ends up showing up in a suit and Perry is the only one who doesn't have nice clothes. Dick's parents have bought him nice clothes and Perry has no one. And again, symbolism, him not having a suit to wear at the trial is symbolic of people not caring about him. In fact, the the somewhat nice clothes that he's wearing, those come from the Myers, the under uh, warden's wife and, and husband, um, the under warden, have provided some things for Perry to wear, but he looks raggedy. You know, he has that height problem where his legs are really short and his pants are all rolled up at the cuff and he just doesn't look professional, well cared for. And I think, I'm not saying that like that was what made him get convicted, but he really even for him to have a thought that someone cared enough about him to take care of him here is not something that Perry has available to him. Um, so while the jury is being selected, Dick and Perry have been asked by a psychiatrist from the local fancy hospital that they weren't allowed to go and visit. He's come to them. They've been asked to write biographies about their lives. And to a certain extent, this is stuff we already knew. And I think by this point in the book, I personally, as a reader, am getting a little fatigued of hearing the same things over and over again. But the benefit that we do see here is that Perry knows how bad his life was and Dick knows how good his life was. And we really, for the first time, see that if we were going to go the nature versus nurture route, and we've talked about this in previous video lectures, and say, you know, that Dick had no reason to become a killer but based on the way he was raised and that Perry did have a reason to become a killer based on the way he was raised. This really kind of just firms that up in our minds and really shows us that, you know, Dick had every opportunity in the world and squandered it and Perry was never given anything. Now, this is the point in the story where Dick starts to establish this whole idea of we knew he was in an accident before as was Perry. Um, but Perry talks about his accident with the physical things that happened, with his legs being so messed up and his aspirin addiction. But Dick talks about his accident as something that caused him to like go insane and become an evil killer. And um, things like that can happen. Here's what I will say. Things like that can happen, okay? If someone has a brain tumor or experiences severe head trauma, that can change their personality. There have been several cases in American history where uh, people have gone on killing sprees or have, you know, done um, a, a mass murder and they've examined their brains later and found out that they had a tumor, something that was affecting their brain physically. Um, in fact, there is some evidence to show that serial killers, people who have a, a proclivity for killing, a, a desire to kill, um, who enjoy killing and in strange ways, that their brains are actually different looking than the brain of a typical person. Um, so I'm not saying that Dick is like crazy to think that his accident could have caused his deviant behavior. But what I am saying is that it's a very convenient thing to be able to say. He also, by the way, blames this accident for him being a pedophile. And again, it's very easy to say like, oh, I would be a normal person who didn't try to have sex with kids and kill people, but I had this car accident. And I just, you know, by this point, I kind of hate Dick. And I don't, I don't want to say I don't care. I mean, if he really is truly being affected by this brain trauma, then what he has done really isn't his responsibility. But it's a little too easy of an excuse for me as a reader at this point in the story to really believe him and really want to believe him. So while the jury is being selected, Dick and Perry are writing these biographies and um, 
we hear some kind of weird things about jury selection. Like there's a guy who's asked, does he believe that capital punishment is okay? Like the death penalty is okay. And he's like, normally I'm against it, but in this case I'm okay with it, which shows that like he kind of has this hatred for Dick and Perry and that he specifically wants them to die. And that's not really the kind of person you want on a jury. A jury is supposed to be impartial until they hear the evidence and then they make a decision based on the evidence and that's their verdict. So there's some things here in the jury selection that are, that are kind of messed up. Um, again, can they get a fair trial in Garden City? Probably not. So maybe, maybe this was destined to happen. Um, so the first witnesses that come in to testify at the trial are, uh, the girls who found the clutter's body, um, the friend Nancy and Susan. And they describe the scene that they saw when they came to the Clutter's house. I think it's a very strong, very good idea for them to be the first witnesses. They're these young, innocent, sweet girls who saw this really horrible thing. And it starts off the trial right away by showing the horror of the crime and really trying to impact the jurors emotionally. And I think when we look at this as a as a case study of a trial, they did a good job of setting that up and making that the first thing that they showed to the jurors. They also end up showing pictures of the crime scene to the jurors. And um, I actually looked up some pictures of the crime scene the other day. Um, uh, Jeff Sexton in my seventh bell told me that they were online and I really didn't think that I would find them, but they are out there and they're pretty disturbing I mean, they really are horrific. And, um, Capote notes in the book, keep in mind, he was at the trial. It's so weird how Capote never talks about himself, but he was here. So when he's describing the looks on people's faces at the trial and stuff, he was there. And then those, that's firsthand, you know, his explanation of what he saw. He says that afterwards, several of the jurors glared at Dick and Perry and looked at them differently as if they were already decided at this point how they felt about them. And again, that kind of evidence, emotional testimony, photographic evidence, is very impactful on how a juror feels. And the emotions are not necessarily what's supposed to affect the jury, but there's a reason that prosecuting attorneys do things like that. Emotions do affect people when we're making decisions, especially in an emotional situation like a murder trial. Um, so the last person to testify on the first day of the trial is Floyd Wells, who was the former cellmate of Dick, who knew kind of the whole story of everything. And it's a tricky thing for him to testify. He has to implicate himself. He has to say, I'm the one who told him about the safe. I knew what he was planning to do, and I did nothing. And the defense attorneys really tried to tear him down because of that. But the problem is that you make Floyd Wells look like a terrible person. And that does hurt his credibility a little bit. It makes him seem, you know, shady and like someone who can't be trusted. But at the end of the day, he is providing very strong evidence that those men were involved in this crime. And uh, it's the kind of evidence that, you know, as Dick said earlier, he probably should have killed Floyd Wells. It's the kind of evidence that they really cannot escape from. Um, so during Dewey's testimony, which is a big part of the reading that we had, there are several things that are revealed to Dick that he did not know. The first thing, which I alluded to in a previous video lecture, is that Perry had amended his testimony. And I find it amazing that Dick didn't know this yet, that his attorney didn't know, that he hadn't been told, that Dick is on trial for murder. And the person who was supposed to be his, his co-defendant, his partner in crime, has said out loud, Dick did not kill anyone. I am the killer. And yet Dick did not know this, and it's not a part of his defense. And I find that very amazing. And the other part is that he finds out that Perry had told Dewey about um, wanting to rape Nancy Clutter. And that was something that Dick didn't know ahead of time that Perry had told him. And I think, you know, that's something that Dick is embarrassed about. It's something that he's bothered by it being said in open court. And I think, you know, it's a shameful thing. I think he should be ashamed that it's being discussed in open court. And I'm sure he probably feels a little betrayed by that. But considering that he was the one that day one told the police when they got arrested, oh, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it was Perry. I don't think he really has much of a right to feel betrayed by Perry. This is my own personal feeling on that. Um, so c coming to the end of this night's reading, we come to the end of the prosecution. The prosecution takes a week 
to build their case against Dick and Perry. And near the end of this, we see Perry's friend from the army actually comes into town to be a character witness at his trial. And that would have been a great expense to him. He lives in um, New England. And so it, it takes, you know, definite time and money for him to come out. And, um, you know, showing again the further affection of Mrs. Meyer, the under warden's wife, she actually lets the army buddy have dinner in Perry's cell. And they set it up with china and a tablecloth and everything. And it's, it's a very nice meal. However, during this meal, when Perry and his friend are talking, Perry reveals that he doesn't care at all about having murdered the clutters. He has no emotion about it at all. He doesn't feel bad for killing four people, two of them children. And the parents weren't very old either, really. Um, and he says that people had done wrong to him throughout his entire life. And he feels like maybe the clutters were just the ones who had to pay for it. And so we see them as scapegoats for Perry's rage and his feelings of inadequacy and his self-hatred. And... It's pretty hard to believe that someone could kill an entire family and not have any feelings about it. And as we go into the next set of reading, the last part of the reading that you guys do, we'll learn some more about some psychiatric um, diagnoses that fit in with the kind of person who could kill an entire family and have no emotion about it whatsoever. Um, and you guys can make your own judgment to, does Perry have a psychiatric disorder? If he does, is that a justification for having done what he did? Should other people have had to pay for the problems that Perry had suffered? It's, it's a big question in the book.